Your challenge, if you choose to accept it, is this. Let's go, let's go! Show up on day one, work out with us for 30 minutes, feel good right away. Yo! Repeat five days a week for three weeks. We're a body, and we call that a body block. Take the fourth week off, and then start again. Choose a new body block each month. Have fun. Avoid burnout. Reach your goals. But you're not going to quit on yourself today. You win? Start a body block today. Visit body.com for a free trial. That's B-O-D-I dot com. At Lowe's, shop deals on top outdoor power equipment during Spring Fest. Save now on the latest in cordless outdoor power with Ego, only at Lowe's. For a limited time only, get $50 off Ego's Touch Drive 21-inch self-propelled lawnmower. And save $20 on select Ego 15 and 16 inch string trimmers. Head to your local Lowe's or visit Lowe's.com and save on all things spring now. Bow through 412. Selection varies by location while supplies last. episode 193 of real life ghost stories and to kick things off this week i need to thank some of our newest patreon subscribers i would like to thank laura kimpling sarah thew loch ness liz sky jolene chelton sam gardner aileen rose brolly rachel ethel g whitney asprey and lindsay gebhardt Thank you so much for subscribing to the Patreon. I love you and appreciate you every single day. And our film review this week. Our film review this week is Scream 6. Scream 6 was released in 2023. It has 7.2 out of 10 on IMDb and 76% on Rotten Tomatoes. In the next instalment, the survivors of the ghost-faced killings leave Woodsboro behind and start a fresh chapter in New York City. Look, I'm going to say it. I was pleasantly surprised by this. I thought it was way better than Scream 5, like for real. And we all know by this point, if you've been listening for a while, you know that slashers are not my vibe. But Scream is such an institution that I really wanted to go and see it. And I I honestly was pleasantly surprised. I think it, like with Scream 5, it leaned into the meta narrative. It was very self-referential. But not too much that it became annoying. And I think with Scream 5, the leaning into the meta, which is all part of the Scream scream world, it got to the point where it started to annoy me. I was like, okay, I get get the joke. I get the joke that it's being self-referential and it's very aware of itself as a horror film. I get it. But it did start to annoy me after a while. Whereas with Scream 6, I thought they really found the balance. I really liked the opening. It was super creative. It was a death that made me question everything. It was really almost over the top violent and gory. Almost that it lost its kind of gruesomeness. And it wasn't like anything I expected them to open the film with. And I was kind of like, okay... Okay, this is interesting. This is an interesting way to open the film and it's leaving me asking some questions. This is going to sound like a really stupid thing to say, but it is an incredibly stabby film. There, There is a lot of stabbing. There is stabbing galore. If stabbing is your vibe, this film is for you. If anybody was counting the amount of individual moments of stabbing there are in this film, I, I would imagine it would be up in the hundreds. And it kind of, do you know what? It does its thing well as a slasher film. It's very stabby. There's lots of blood. There's lots of like visceral, like full kind of impact violence. But it somehow doesn't become ridiculously gratuitous. And I'm not really sure how they found that balance, but I really think they did. They found both the balance between leaning into the meta narrative, but also the balance between it being a slasher film that is stabby but not being so gross out violent that it becomes uncomfortable to watch. I am um, I also really liked the script. I thought it was a well-written film and I liked the characters. I really wanted the characters 
to survive. I wanted them to do well. I wanted them to figure it out. And there were some really great punch the air moments and so many references back to the old Scream films. So if you're a big Scream fan, as in if you like all of the films, I honestly, I think you're going to really enjoy this one. And I just want to say that I guessed the killer, so don't even worry about it. But I would also say that I threw out about seven names as to who I thought the killer was. <laughs> I went to see this with Sinead and our friend Ro and pretty much every person that came on screen. I was like, Sinead, that person is the killer. I can guarantee it. And then that person would die and I'd be like, God damn it. They're not the killer at all. In regards to the dislikes with this film, it's kind of difficult. I think if you're not into slashers, it's not going to be your thing. You're going to struggle. I'm not a big slasher person and it's not that I struggled with it, but I'm never going to love it. I'm never going to come out of the cinema and be like, oh my God, that was amazing. There is a huge amount of shoehorning in of tropes (laughs) and just general stuff from the other Scream movies. And like I said, I didn't think it was as bad as the previous films in terms of the kind of leaning into the horror tropes getting annoying but it's still there and it very much like nods to itself when it when it kind of tries to wedge in all of these horror tropes. It's not my type of film. I knew that before I watched it, but I had a lot of fun watching it. I really enjoyed it. And I kind of went and, and read some criticism about it online. And one of the biggest criticisms that I saw from fans of the Scream franchise was that there wasn't enough deaths in the film. And they, they kept talking about how um, just, you know, just random people die. That was one of the biggest criticisms. It was like, oh, there's just randoms dying and blah, blah, blah. And I sort of thought, I don't really know if that's a valid enough <laughs> criticism. And I, and I did also think, good on the scriptwriters for going, hang on, we're not just going to kill off everybody. Let's make this film violent and stabby and all of those things. But also let's let some people survive. And I appreciated that. I also forgot to mention in my likes column that the film is obviously set in New York City and I really enjoyed it. I thought it brought a really interesting extra dimension. There's really great scenes with the teens on the subway. There is great scenes in the city, in like little corner shops. And I thought they were really well done and added a great dimension to the film. There is one thing I thought that really annoyed me about this film. And there is a whole ongoing idea in the film about one of the characters who is having delusions. She is seeing her dead father who was one of the original ghost face killers. And honestly, it adds fucking nothing to the story. It adds nothing to the story Only that it annoyed me every time it happened. I'm pretty sure it happened in Scream 5 as well. But they've obviously continued with this this narrative of her having delusions of her dead dad. And honestly, it annoyed me every single time. It adds nothing to the story. Give it up. Scream people, scream writers, if you're listening to this, because we know you're going to make another movie, just give it up. Leave the delusions. Cut it cut it out of the script. It doesn't add anything. It's stupid. It annoys me every single time. Every single time it happened, I wanted to punch both her and her delusion of her dad square in the face. All in all, I enjoyed it. I think if you take it for what it is, it is a fun film to watch. I'm going to give it four stars. I think that even though slasher films aren't my thing, I think it's unfair to actually give it anything less because I really had a good time in the cinema watching it. And you know what? It's pretty good. So four stars for Scream 6. Today's episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. Now, look, I know I've been doing fun, silly ads for HelloFresh at the moment, but I thought I needed to do at least one ad where you could really get an idea of what HelloFresh is all about. Did you know that March is National Nutrition Month and HelloFresh makes it easy to choose delicious dietitian approved meals. Simply look for the dietitian win tag on their menu choices for meals with under 700 calories and with one third less sodium. And those aren't the only options. So you can choose quick cook. You can choose that your box is family friendly, carb smart, protein rich, vegetarian, pork free. There are so many different options to choose from. 
HelloFresh sends you seasonal recipes that come with ingredients already pre-proportioned. So all you have to do is cook and enjoy. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm not a good cook. It's not something that comes naturally to me. But let me tell you when I'm getting HelloFresh, I, I feel like I feel like I'm Gordon Ramsay, you know. I'm taking pictures of every meal and I'm sending it into the group chat. To be honest, HelloFresh is one of those things that I'm always going to recommend whether I'm advertising for them or not. It's quick, it's easy, it's great for people who maybe aren't very good cooks like me. It's cost effective and it also saves on a ton of waste. So go to HelloFresh.com forward slash Real Life Ghost Stories 60 and use the code Real Life Ghost Stories 60 for 60% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com forward slash Real Life Ghost Stories 60 and use the code Real Life Ghost Stories 60 for 60% off plus free shipping. Today's episode is sponsored by HERS. This time of year, all of the emphasis is always on organising your space. It's always on wellness. It's on spring cleaning. It's on fresh starts. But actually, the most important way to take care of yourself is to take care of your mental health. And you can do so at forhers.com. At forhers.com, you can get access to real medical providers who can prescribe trusted anxiety and depression medication if it is right for you. The process is 100% online, including unlimited check-ins, provider messaging and support along the way. Plus, to make things even simpler, you can get your first month of treatment for just $25 if prescribed. To get started, go to forhers.com slash spring. That's forhers.com slash spring. And I know for some people that getting access to proper mental health care can be a serious source of stress in and of itself. It also can be really difficult to talk to healthcare providers face to face about things like your sexual health, about things like hair loss and about things like your mental health. That is why HERS makes it simple. Get started today at forhers.com slash spring. That's forhers, F-O-R-H-E-R-S dot com slash S-P-R-I-N-G. The offer is only available if prescribed. Prescription products require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. The subscription is required. Additional restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. Which brings us to our story this week. As always, all of the links to where I got my research, my sources are in the description of this episode. But I want to give a special shout out to Mysteries of the Unexplained podcast. They did an episode on the Van Meter Visitor and also to the YouTube channel Bedtime Stories, which is a great YouTube channel. And I would highly, highly recommend checking it out. They do great spooky paranormal stories with beautiful visuals so just wanted to give a shout out to bedtime stories and mysteries of the unexplained before we get started so let's get into our story this week i know it always shocks people when i say that i am not a scientist but just to reiterate i am not a scientist but i have always been someone with a can-do attitude if i can youtube it i can do it and of course that extends to science For today's episode, I am bringing you some top-class science that is going to blow your mind. That's probably an exaggeration, but it is interesting nonetheless. The active search for intelligent extraterrestrial life has gone on for well over 50 years and has yielded no results so far. The basic idea behind the search for intelligent extraterrestrial life is simple at its core. The universe is enormous. So it would be foolish to think that there wasn't intelligent extraterrestrial life out there somewhere. Life, including intelligent life, evolved on Earth. Yet, there shouldn't be anything particularly remarkable about our planet. It's just another random world in the galaxy. So if intelligent life happened here, it must be pretty common. Common enough that we should be seeing signs of alien civilizations all over the place. There have, of course, been moments of seeming breakthrough, like the WOW signal from 1977. The WOW signal was detected on August 15th, 1977, at the Big Ear Radio Observatory in Ohio, during a search for signs of extraterrestrial intelligence. The signal was unusual, and when reviewing the data a few days later, astronomer Jerry Amon 
wrote WOW next to it. Since then, for 40 years, some have claimed the signal was made by aliens. Others have said that a star caused it. Many people theorised as to what might have caused the signal. But there has been no agreed upon explanation. Part of the problem is that we have no framework as to what intelligent extraterrestrial life might operate like in the universe. So the attempts to find it are wild guesswork at best. So people have been looking for signs of intelligent life in our universe for decades, to no avail. Many believe that the reason we haven't been successful is because our universe is just too vast for us to find extraterrestrials. But others say that we're just not looking in the right place. Meaning, we shouldn't even be focusing on searching for life on other planets. But we should instead be searching for life in other dimensions. And this is where it becomes a bit technical for a minute. And despite my ownership of a white lab coat, I'm going to quote this next bit from HowStuffWorks.com. Particle physics seeks to explain the origins of the universe and the fundamental building blocks of matter by studying the irreducibly small particles that make up atoms. It's often called the theory of everything, working towards one single elegant solution to explain how matter and energy works. In the standard model of physics, particles are understood to be point-like, like impossibly tiny dots. The standard model is still theoretical because there's still a lot we don't understand about the force of gravity. String theory is another model of physics where instead of dots, particles are tiny strings all vibrating together to create size and mass. But for string theory to be accurate, it means there could be more than 10 dimensions instead of the four we're used to experiencing. Length, width, depth and time. Some of these dimensions could theoretically be places where the Big Bang never happened, and the universe had an entirely different starting point. What would a creature from a dimension like that look like to humans from the fourth dimension? Lovecraftian monsters? Demogorgons? Or maybe demons? Or fairies from folklore? The late ufologist John Keel was a believer in extraterrestrials, but moved away from that after time. He began to think that all the stories from folklore and religious texts were proof that humanity has indeed made contact with another form of intelligent life, but that they weren't from outer space. Instead, they were beings from other dimensions. Ultra-terrestrials. Keel theorised that these beings could shapeshift to look like anything and attributed them to stories of demons, monsters, angels, ogres and changelings. He thought these ultra-terrestrials likely had a sense of right and wrong and that they could manipulate mankind. But why? If there are ultra-terrestrials... What would be the motivation of a 5th, 6th or 7th dimension creature coming to the 4th dimension to make mischief? And how do they move between dimensions? Keel thought that there were magnetic anomalies that made it easier for ultra-terrestrials to materialise, but wasn't sure how they got to the 4th dimension. In 1903, the small town of Van Meter in Iowa in the United States had a population of around 407. It was a quiet, secluded and nondescript little place and not very much happened there. It was the 29th of September and U.G. Griffith was marvelling how every year the cold nip in the air in September still caught him off guard. He turned his collar up against the chill and felt the ache of fatigue in his bones. It was almost 1am and he was tired. Griffith was a tool dealer and every day was a slog. People needed tools, that was for sure. But the demand in this small town was not as high as he would like. Griffith had lived in Van Meter most of his life and he knew the town like the back of his hand. As he trudged down the street towards home, 
he noticed something that was decidedly out of place. From the top of the nearby Mather and Griggs building, there shone a light, a spotlight that he had never seen before. Like I said, UG Griffith had lived in Van Meter his whole life and this light was new. It was out of place. He was worried that someone was up to no good so he gingerly stepped off his beaten track towards the light. He was as quiet as he could be not wanting to draw attention to himself but as he approached the light it moved across the road in an instant to the roof of another building. Griffith stopped in his tracks. What in the world? It looked as though the light had simply flown through the air. How is that possible? He watched in awe and again the light jumped to another rooftop before it eventually shot straight up into the air and vanished. He flicked through the possible scenarios in his head, but none were satisfactory. None could explain the lone spotlight jumping from rooftop to rooftop. UG Griffith was a man of good standing in the community, so when, on the morning of the 30th of September, he began to talk about what he had experienced, people stopped and listened. He was an honest and well-respected man, and it was clear that what he had seen had perturbed him. By talking about it, he was trying to find answers and make sense of what he had seen the night before. But there was no answer forthcoming. Even after a thorough search of the buildings was conducted... As happens in small towns, news travelled fast that Griffith had seen something odd the night before. Most thought that it was simply a prowler and a case of mistaken identity. But whatever people believed, the story had made them feel on edge. Slightly nervous. That night, Dr. Alcott, the town's physician, was lying on a cot in his back office. He was tossing and turning and struggling to get to sleep. He was facing the wall when he became aware of a light flooding the room through the window behind him. The light was bright and unnatural. Dr. Alcott knew immediately that this was the same prowler that Griffith had seen last night. He had heard the strange story and he was not afraid. Instead, he leaped out of bed and grabbed his pistol, ready to shoot down any intruder. He barreled down the stairs and out the door to confront the prowler face to face, man to man. Except what he came face to face with was not a man. This was a creature. A monster from the depths of hell. The creature was humanoid in shape, but it was definitely not human. It had bat-like wings with a huge wingspan. At the end of each wing were a series of long talons that the creature was using to grip the side of the building. But its face, its face terrified Dr. Alcott. It possessed what looked like a beak and had a single horn protruding from its forehead. And from that horn, the light was being emitted. Dr. Alcott couldn't believe his eyes. This creature was not like anything he had read or heard about in stories from childhood. He shook himself out of his stupor, raised his gun and fired. In all, Dr. Alcott fired his gun at the creature five times. After the first shot, the creature turned its head to look at Alcott, blinding him with the light that emanated from the horn. And after the fifth bullet, the creature let out an ear-splitting shriek and flew off into the night sky. The following morning, the authorities arrived on the scene to investigate what had taken place the night before. Dr. Alcott was shook and seemed to be rambling about demons and winged creatures. But something had definitely happened. There were five shell casings outside the house where Alcott had claimed to see the monster. And the authorities could clearly see damage to the brickwork that looked suspiciously like claw marks. But there was no sign that the creature had suffered any ill effects from the five bullets that were shot in its direction. There was no blood and no entrails, despite the fact that Alcott believed that he had hit it at least once. By now, the people were freaked. Word spread that the town doctor had come face to face with this winged entity, and people put two and two together and came to the conclusion that it was the same figure that Griffith had seen the night before. The townspeople were on high alert, and on the 1st of October, 
Clarence Dunn had decided that the only way to keep the bank safe was to conduct a vigil there overnight with his shotgun in hand just in case. He was a teller in the bank and was determined that his bank was not going to be impacted by this light-wielding creature. But Dunn soon realised that nighttime vigils are inherently boring and he found himself dozing off on the floor of the bank, propped up against the wall with a shotgun across his lap. When he awoke, he wasn't immediately sure what had awoken him. He yawned and rubbed his face but moved his hand quickly back to his shotgun when he heard it. There was a sound coming from outside one of the windows. A gurgling, rasping sound. It sounded like someone or something gasping for air, like they were being strangled. He checked the time and noted that it was past 1am and he made his way slowly and quietly across the room to the source of the noise. He edged towards the window and peered his face cautiously around the window frame. No sooner had his eyes peered through the glass than he was blinded by a bright light bursting through from the outside. It illuminated the room and the flash blinded Dunn. Dunn stumbled backwards, shocked by the light, and put his hand over his eyes trying to shield them from the light and peer through it. The light was sweeping back and forth over the room as though surveying it. The sweeping motion allowed Dunn to catch a glimpse of the culprit. It was just as the doctor had said. There was a creature. A demonic face with a pointed snout that was full of sharp teeth. It had a pair of dead, soulless black eyes and a horn that was emitting light. Dunn's finger squeezed the trigger on his shotgun and he fired straight through the glass at the creature. The creature, seemingly uninjured, disappeared into the night sky. The following morning, the police found anomalous, large, three-toed footprints outside the window of the bank. And again, the next evening, the strange visitor would make another appearance, this time to hardware store owner O.V. White. White was sound asleep when he was awoken by an unearthly sound. It was a shrill, piercing wail that sounded like the scraping and grinding of metal. White was prepared. He had heard the stories of the previous three encounters and had gone to bed that night with a rifle close by. He commando crawled to his window and peered through, only his eyes and the barrel of his rifle visible. Fifteen feet away from the window was a telephone pole and on that pole was a creature. White took aim and fired, but instead of the creature being injured or toppling from the pole like one would expect, it snapped its head to peer at White, opened its wings, and White was hit with a stench that completely overpowered him. It was so strong and repugnant that it caused him to become dizzy and eventually lose consciousness. The ruckus was heard by local shopkeeper Sidney Gregg, who ran out onto the street to see what had happened. He watched in horror as a huge humanoid creature descended from the telephone pole, seemingly using its large beak as leverage. When it reached the ground, he stared as it stood on its kangaroo-like hind legs at eight feet tall. The light was beaming from the horn in its head, and it leaped and bounded into the night, finally ascending into the air with a flap of its wings. But on October the 3rd, the townspeople seemed to get some answers about their mystery creature. J. L. Platt Jr., who was the manager of a tile and brick factory out on the outskirts of the town, heard strange noises at around 1am. This wasn't the first time he had heard strange noises coming from the mine. It was a regular issue, and he reported it time and time again and was never taken seriously. He left the factory and followed the sounds into the dark night and realised that the cacophony was coming from the old abandoned coal mine around which the town had been built. He described the sound as being like Satan and a regiment of imps were coming forth for a battle. Platt was armed and ready and moved towards the coal mine where he saw one of the creatures looming at one of the entrances. But there wasn't just one creature. There was another smaller creature and both were emitting a beam of light from a single horn on their heads. As he watched, the two creatures took off into the night sky. 
the town had had enough. The people decided that the mine system was evidently the creature's lair and it was time to do something about it. A posse of heavily armed men set up camp at the mouth of the mine ready to take on the creatures should they return. And they did return. Again at around 1am and they were met with the roar of firearms as the bullets rained down on them. According to one newspaper report, the reception they received would have sunk the Spanish fleet. But aside from unearthly noise and peculiar odour, they did not seem to mind it, but slowly descended the shaft of the old mine. The bullets, in short, did nothing. But the creatures descended back down into the mine and the entrance to the mine was barricaded, squashing the sightings of the Van Meter visitor. So what happened in Van Meter? And what was the Van Meter visitor? Unfortunately, as with most of these stories of high strangeness, there is very little actual evidence of the Van Meter visitor. There are newspaper reports and word of mouth accounts, but these newspaper stories are from a time when sensationalist stories were very important for the sale of newspapers. The word of mouth accounts also vary dramatically, and even in the research for this episode, there are differences in the accounts that are told as fact. But regardless of the lack of evidence, people continue to speculate over the Van Meter visitor, with many people wondering whether it is possible that the creature was actually an ultra-terrestrial being. Kevin Lee Nelson co-wrote a book called The Van Meter Visitor, A True and Mysterious Encounter with the Unknown. And in an interview with the website The Bigfoot Diaries, he said, That's the big question. What was the Van Meter visitor? In the book, we explore a wide variety of theories, from the mundane hoax to mass hysteria to more exotic ones, like a possible ultra-terrestrial. The odd part about the Van Meter visitor is that it exhibited a number of bizarre and unearthly traits. A horn that projected a bright light beam, metallic sounds and immunity to gunfire. I can't speak for my co-authors, but I tend to put it in the ultra-terrestrial category much like Mothman, due to its seemingly paraphysical nature. In fact, the features of the Van Meter case are so similar to events of the Mothman case that one could consider it a proto-Mothman event, as it happened 60 years before the events in Point Pleasant. The overpowering sulphur-like odour is also a common trait associated with alleged ultra-terrestrials like Florida's skunk ape, which got its name from its terrible smell. Like John Keel and Jacques Valley, one of our working theories is that many paranormal events and encounters may all fall under the umbrella of ultra-terrestrial phenomena. And this seems to be the general consensus among paranormal investigators, that the Van Meter visitor is an ultra-terrestrial, something that had emerged in our dimension from another dimension. And this accounts for the sheer bizarreness of the stories. There are, of course, other explanations that are posited, like a prank or a ploy by an economically struggling town for tourism. And there were a number of hoaxes that were happening at the time, like a giant skeleton in Cardiff, New York, and dragons in the state of Texas. Whatever the Van Meter creature was, ghost, alien, mystery animal, or interdimensional being, it continues to be a strange case that has never been adequately solved. So I don't, I don't know what's happening to me with this story. I don't know what's going on in my brain. Maybe it's the fact that I'm wearing a lab coat. But I, I sort of believe this story and I don't know why. I hope you all enjoyed, first of all, my amazing science at the beginning of this episode. I still don't really understand what any of that meant, to be honest. My mind is still blown by the fact that the four dimensions are length, width, depth and time. <laughs> That probably sounds like a really naive and stupid thing to say. But I was like, those are the, those are the dimensions? Those four things? They're the dimensions? Obviously. So with these other dimensions, so there's more than 10 dimensions apparently, according to string theory, the idea that these dimensions could exist where the Big Bang never happened and therefore we have absolutely no concept of how life would have evolved sort of blows my mind because everything as we know it wouldn't be the same. So therefore, life in those dimensions could literally be anything. And maybe because this 
theory of ultra terrestrials as a sort of a you could almost call it like pseudo scientific basis. I I kind of I, I kind of like it. You know what I mean? I kind of <laughs> I kind of feel like yeah, this is where all these cryptids could be coming from. Maybe they are ultra terrestrial beings. Maybe I've just been doing this podcast for too long, or maybe I just love cryptids too much. So to take it away from my uh, very incredible scientific knowledge for a second, because I am at risk of embarrassing myself further. This story has elements that really reminded me of spring Jack. So the story of spring Jack, I did it on Patreon years ago and I haven't done it on the main podcast. But basically it was Victorian time in England and this this entity known as spring Jack kind of wreaked havoc around London and eventually kind of moved further up north. But it, it was a man, basically a humanoid figure. He had some sort of a like silvery suit on, I think, and like a metal mask and he breathed fire and was able to jump onto buildings. And it was very widely reported on and very widely discussed. And kind of the question is not whether or not spring Jack happened. The question is, what was it? And a lot of people believed that it was some man who actually was just in a very clever disguise. Now, it must have been a pretty incredible disguise because it breathed fire. It He was able to jump from the street onto the roof of buildings. That's that's pretty that's pretty impressive as costumes go. But there is something about this story that gives me very definite spring heeled Jack vibes. And it's not just the trope of jumping from rooftop to rooftop. There's something about the absurdity that gives the two stories kind of weird similarities. And with spring Jack, people wondered, obviously, if it was some sort of prank that was orchestrated by somebody who was very adept at making costumes. And with the Van Meter visitor, there are people who question whether or not the Van Meter visitor was a prank that was orchestrated by local young people. And to be honest... I just don't believe that that is the case because this creature was shot at so many times. And I just think that if this was a load of young people who were doing this in the very first instance where the Van Meter visitor was shot at five times, I think at that point, even as a teenager, you would go, oh, maybe this is not a good idea because I feel like somebody's going to get shot. Like it's pretty funny, but but it won't be funny if somebody gets shot. And I always think that if a prank is orchestrated by more than one person, you are a bazillion times more likely for that to be outed because people are just terrible at keeping secrets, you know. And with the way that the Van Meter visitor is described in all of these stories, like it's a big winged creature, it's like scaling walls, it's on the top of telephone poles, it is flying up into the air, it's jumping from rooftop to rooftop, like that would have to be a pretty elaborate series of strings and pulleys for a lot of young people to be orchestrating this as a hoax, to be honest. So I just, I just don't think it's a prank. And the other kind of theory that is often bandied around is that it was a tourism ploy. And uh, I, I, I get it. I get why people would think that the town wasn't doing great back in those days. Um, and it, when it had a population of 407 people, apparently, around the time that the Van Meter sightings happened. And I don't know if I believe that it that it's a tourism ploy, to be honest. So at the time, there was a guy in Cardiff in New York who had a giant skeleton. He had unearthed a giant skeleton and he was showing it off to people and obviously it turned out to be a hoax. And at the time, there were dragons being sighted in the state of Texas and flying lizards, which also ended up being a hoax. But here's the thing, right? A giant and dragons are both things that already existed in lore. So you can capture people's imaginations with that. If you say Bigfoot, if you say giants, if you say dragons, if you say fairies, if you say like poltergeist ghosts, all of those things are already things that people would know about from their own stories, from their own imagination, whatever it is. They would have heard something about those creatures before. And There's a part of us, I think, that always wants to believe that these magical things exist. So therefore, it might be easier for people to go, oh, a giant. They found a giant. Giants do exist. They found a dragon. Dragons do exist. But a fucking humanoid winged creature with kangaroo legs and a horn in the middle of its forehead that emits light. 
sorry, something went completely off the rails in that town meeting if that was what they decided to go for in order to boost tourism for the area. It's like, what are we going to, what are we going to, what are we going to say is the creature that everyone's been seeing that's going to bring people into the area? Uh, I know. Uh, let's do something with wings. Yeah, brilliant. Write that down. Wings. Kangaroo legs. Okay, little little unusual. Yeah, write that down too though. Yeah, I'm into it. Uh, a beak. Okay. Okay, a beak that it, that it can use to climb things uh, with some teeth. And uh, I feel like we might be getting carried away here. No, 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 no. We're good. We're good. We're on track. Oh, no, I've got it. I've got it. A horn in the middle of its forehead. And out of that horn comes a beam of light. Imagine. There's silence for a few minutes. That is it. We've got it. We've nailed it. Is is that really what happened? I just don't... I can't imagine it. But maybe I'm just too naive about the lengths that people will go to to pull a prank or to try and promote tourism in your area. I think it's more likely to be a case of mass hysteria than a case of a tourism ploy, to be honest. But again, people don't seem to be getting kind of like shadowy glimpses of this thing. It seems that people got a pretty good look at the van meter visitor or rather visitors because, you know, we know there were apparently two of them. And it, yeah, it seems that people were getting a good look and to be able to see it's got a beak, it's got sharp teeth, it's got like black soulless eyes, this <laughs> horn in the middle of its forehead that emits a light. What? The, how is this my job? It still baffles me all the time. And here's my kind of final thoughts on this. Is it possible that it is a cryptid from another dimension? I I don't know. I kind of want that to be true in a way because it opens up so many doors for things that are deemed to be supernatural or paranormal. And I, I kind of was reminded as well of the story of the Green Children of Woolpit, which is another story that I did on Patreon. And this episode feels a bit like it's some sort of a um, an undisclosed plug for Patreon. It's not. But I didn't do these episodes on the main. Um, and the Green Children of Woolpit is a really famous story of these two children who emerged from, well, they said they emerged from a cave. So they went into a cave in their homeland and they um, followed a beam of light and emerged in Woolpit in the east of England and the children were completely green and they were eventually assimilated into the community and when they learned how to speak English they would talk about how I think one of the children died and then I think it was the girl that assimilated into the community and she talked about how she came from somewhere where it was always twilight and that everyone where she was from was green. Now there's lots of historical um, theories as to who these children were that it wasn't supernatural at all but like they also came from a cave the van meter visitor apparently came from a cave and like I said in the beginning there are theorists I mean supernatural paranormal theorists but theorists nonetheless who believe that these ultra terrestrial creatures are able to travel to our dimension because of magnetic forces that allow sort of portals to open up. Oh, I sound insane. Look, I don't know what to tell you guys, but apparently I believe in this. I don't know what's happening either. Maybe I've just been doing this podcast for too long. Maybe I'm becoming less cynical in my old age. But uh, I don't know. There's something about this story that I really love. And I'm pretty sure that everything that is supernatural, paranormal, every story we've ever done, I'm now just going to go, it's ultra terrestrials every time. It's going to be the new opposite to infrasound. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you would like to send in your story, you can do so by emailing it to Podcast at gmail.com. You can also check out the website reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. And if you are desperate for extra content, you can sign up to Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content, as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad free. And on that note, I shall see you next time. 